thankful for you and being here. Hopefully we'll have a few more to, to roll on in, but we're excited to pick back up after uh, taking last week off for our gospel meeting. I know that was well uh, worth our time to be together last week, and so uh, we're thankful now to be back together this week. I do want to do just a quick follow-up back to Lesson 4 uh, concerning goals and just get a little uh, interaction or feedback from you about um, how you may have applied that lesson. Raise your hand. Let, us, let me know. Let us know. If you went to the, the exercise, the uh, challenge to share a spiritually related goal with at least one other person during the past two weeks. Did anybody make a spiritual goal and then send a message or sit down with somebody and say, hey, this is what I'm planning to do. I'm committing to this specifically. Can you help me? Can you pray for me? Did anybody share that with anyone? Okay, good. Got a few? Good job. Got something you can do still? If you didn't do that, let's follow up on that this week. Uh, research tends to show that when we do share our goals, we tend to do better. Uh, but sometimes we can fall prey to sharing them too widely. And then we kind of fall prey for the, the emotions that come with sharing it instead of from completing the goal. But if we'll share it with people with whom we trust, uh, people that we know we're going to see regularly or keep in contact regularly that can help us, uh, to keep our goals. One other way of following up about goals, did anyone make a goal within the past two weeks or maybe the week leading up to last, uh, the, the, that lesson and then completed it already? Anybody done something that was short-term enough that you've completed it? Raise your hand if you've done that. Got a few hands, good. That's good. Small goals are not bad goals because they can build momentum and we can turn those into bigger goals. And sometimes we aim way too big and then we get discouraged from not meeting it soon. So if you completed something in the past two weeks that you set out in a dedicated way to accomplish, then great job and, and thank you for doing that. Let's pray and then we'll dive into lesson five about balance. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for who you are. We're thankful for all that you give us in your word. And we're thankful that your word reveals you, it reveals your love, and it also reveals how we should live to please you and how we would do well to live in the world you've created. Help us to seek that wisdom and guidance, especially as we consider these things this morning about balance and knowing that it comes on a foundation of responsibility and, and doing our best and making specific goals that will help us to grow. Help us to be balanced and to be mindful of every area of our lives uh, to give those things our best and keep growing in all of them. We're thankful for this good church here. We're thankful we can grow together and help each other. We're thankful for your love upon us in Jesus. Bless us this morning in our study. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, ma'am. And I said, uh, she said, Miss Peggy, I appreciate you. I can't believe you've ever been bashful. And I said, well, believe it. And I said, if you don't believe it, uh, t ask Lona. And she said, well, I just appreciate it so much. She said, now then I can, maybe I can start on my goal. She said, that said, you really helped me to well, good. think about it and everything. Good. And well, I, said, I said, you can. I said, we'll help you. You can't. Good. Well, great. So, Thank well, you for sharing that. Well, I, I appreciated it very much. <laughs> good, good. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. We're thankful for whomever did that to you, too. That's great uh, to see the, the generations meeting up together. And uh, your example and sharing that is helpful to someone. And that's great. It can be helpful to us all. So that's what we hope to gain through interaction and through discussion and through sharing uh, from each other's lives. So thank you, Miss Peggy. Appreciate that and appreciate you. All right, so balance. Balancing life's will is what he calls this chapter. And he opens with some examples of how important balance is in, in so many just practical areas of life. That if your tires or wheels on your car are out of balance, it makes for a bumpy ride. It makes for a rough ride. It's going to cause your tires, your car to deteriorate much quicker if they're out of balance. You want to balance in terms of 
of kind of the, the big level, the macroeconomic level between nations and world economies to have trade in and out that's balanced helps to keep economy strong. Have a balance of power is necessary for peace. Think about how scary that one is when we think about politics. Some of the things that get under our skin or that, that cause us to maybe lose a little sleep at night are times when maybe a certain area of our government, our three pillars of government, if one seems to have more power than they were originally delegated or exceeds the balance of powers, see that, that begins to be a scary proposition. If you have a watch that's analog, pre-digital watches, you know, it's, it's all a set of gears that work together and they have to be properly weighted and balanced to keep the proper time. We talk about food and eating a balanced diet. They keep changing the pyramid every now and then, but they have a pyramid that tries to show here's how much you should have on an average daily basis so that your fats and your protein and your carbs all balance each other. If on a personal level, a microeconomic level, if you fail to properly balance a checkbook, so it'll lead to financial troubles. There are balances in nature, say, between predators and prey. Predators naturally thin out populations of other animals that might become a nuisance. But there's a balance. There's balance between the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. And, and all the different levels of nature, they all balance each other to make for a healthy environment. Balanced exercise keeps us physically fit. We only work out one group of muscles, then we can become unbalanced and unhealthy, even in terms of being physically fit. You do cardio and strength training, all those kind of things are supposed to work together to keep us safe and, and prime physical condition. But as he moves into those examples, those are illustrations about how important it is that our lives as a whole must be balanced. So those are areas that we can see the principle at work. But when it comes to how we live, that's the most important area we need to see the principle at play. He says this, an out of balanced life cannot live a positive Christian life. That's a strong statement. An out of balanced life doesn't have the capacity to live a positive Christian life. Anybody do a double take? You read that statement? Right. Without balance, we'll never find peace, okay? When it comes to living a balanced life, I sure am deceived in thinking, oh, I can still find positive. I can still find good. I can still find excellence. I'll just let this area slide today or tonight or for this week. And yet they are dependent upon one another. When Christ made that promise of an abundant life. Clearly, he has in mind the spiritual provisions he gives. But his promises, his blessings are not reserved just to that realm alone. It's not just one area of life. He promises blessings and joy in every area of our lives when we pursue him. Because this world was designed and created by him. And so when we pursue his will, it gives us growth improvement, betterment in every area of our lives. Do we struggle? Just looking at some of your, our faces as we talk through that slide. I know the answer, right? But do we struggle as a culture, as a society with balance? We need different in the church? Because I'm a Christian, because I live by faith in Christ, am I more balanced, more responsible across the board than maybe the world might be? Obviously, we're not living in comparison with them, but just for sake of, of thinking through this. Are we much better? I saw a title of an article. I didn't have the time really to read the article, but I saw a title that I think expresses maybe how we often live. Our plates are full, but our tanks are empty. Is that true? Boy, we've got a lot of opportunities. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Look at me, I'm busy. But when it comes to how I'm living, when it comes to energy, when it comes to enjoyment, 
comes the peace that Miss Sandra talked about. Boy, I sure do feel empty sometimes, despite all that I'm doing on my plate. It's going to ultimately come back to a life of balance or a life without proper balance. So he's going to talk about a wheel, and we'll get to that illustration shortly. But this is just kind of taking a step back from that illustration and just seeing balance as a whole. That concept is a function of weight. Do you balance one weight with something else? Okay, so a seesaw weighing mechanism. You've got two things and you need them to be of equal weight to cause that to be flat and parallel to the ground. It's balanced weight. Okay, the wheel works the same way. Those spokes balance all the weight of the vehicle. If one spoke is shorter or cracked than the others, it cannot bear the weight as effectively and eventually it risks the whole wheel, which eventually risks the whole, risks the whole vehicle. Think about the importance of balance and how it connects to weight with pails of water. I'm fortunate enough I didn't have to grow up doing that. Probably be better off if I had to. If I had to. So if you need some well water moved, to, you might could, could coerce me to come help you with it a little bit or something. But you take pails of water and you move them from point A to point B and how you're able to effectively balance that weight of that water determines how much you end up with in point B. If you go too fast, if your arms are too weak, if you can't balance the weight of the water, you begin to lose water because it spills out. You can't handle the weight effectively. You can't balance it so it all spills out. So too, as we live for Christ, we're moving our lives from point A to point B. Are we able to live in such a way that what flows out of us is what he gives us? Are we able to arrive where he wants us to arrive and growing in him and, and at the end of this life, arriving in heaven safely because we've balanced all the things he's entrusted to our care? So balance is a function of weight. Can my life and how I live, can it support, does it support everything I need to do and I'm attempting to do? Or do I keep adding and it keep making a mess? Okay, so that's introduction explaining the concept of balance. What questions, comments might you have at this stage? Just balance in general, this, carrying this illustration and this principle throughout this lesson. Anything anyone would like to add? Yes, Miss Debbie. There's a story that I read that branch opened at the Mm-hmm. But they understood the concept of having so many things to do during the day, you don't get to sit back and just do absolutely nothing. Uh -huh. And that was the concept there. And they always like it because mama cries, uh -huh. because the car won't start, and they can't get to their uh, different things they wanted to do. Uh -huh. And I told them, I said, that's why you make time for God to read the Bible, to have time with family, and to enjoy all your things in right. life. And they, at that young an age, they understood it and appreciated it. Cool. Very good. The, the quicker we can learn it, the better. Right? You remember the name of the book? Too Much Pressure. Bernstein Bears. I remember a lot of those as a kid. That's great. Very good. Don? Just something I wanted to mention. Uh, talk about balance there. It's a 20-something year old. I work for a uh, comp Hold company. Like yeah. Work for a company. And uh, we worked lots of hours. I was single, so that was an advantage. What we wanted to bring out was the, the balance of work and family. Uh, a lot of people worked a lot of hours, made a lot of good money, but they told us one day they'd done a survey with the company, and the divorce rate was 85% with that company. So wow. the balance between family and other things had been let go. So balance is very important. Right. Very good. Thank you for that. That's, uh, that's a great lead-in and precursor to... Some of the things we'll talk about in this list. That's great. That's, if you see that statistic, that should be an alarming thing. If you run that company, if you work for that company, that's, that's eye-opening. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Because his advertisement said his father said to do, th to do two things at once is to do, is to do neither. Right. And that's what I've thought about and I've, with this lesson. Right. That's a very good thought, to do two things at once. 
is to do neither. Okay, very good. Sports world says if you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks. Similar idea, I suppose. You can only do one, one at a time. All right, great stuff. Ah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that because I hadn't really ever had to do it. But why? Because you're balanced. Okay, very good. Okay, let's dive into kind of how he lays this out. One thing that I thought of as I kept reading through it, but I think if you'll read closely, you'll see he addresses it, just not maybe um, as explicitly as he could have, but that's not a, a weakness of his or anything. It's just a, an observation. But he, he throws out here this, oops, hey, Matt. Never mind. I got it. I had it turned off. Throws out this idea of this illustration of a wheel, wagon wheel perhaps, with six uh, wooden spokes. And he's got these six areas of life that each represent a spoke. And, and the first time or two I read through this, I thought, well, that's, that's good and all, but, but why is the spiritual spoke a spoke like the rest? Isn't that the main thing? Isn't that, shouldn't that be the only thing and all the other ones come off of that? And I think that's a true principle. Colossians 4, verse 3, uh, Jesus, or Paul says that when Christ, who is your life, appears, you'll appear with him in glory. So that is true, that Christ must be the center of our lives, that everything we do comes from Christ. But what's interesting is he later, he's going to reference uh, Luke 2, 52. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. In that text... Luke doesn't say, he could have, it would have been accurate, but he doesn't say Jesus grew in favor with God, colon, which means he also grew in favor with wisdom and uh, you know, physical strength and favor with man. He could have, it would have been accurate. But in that list, God would appear just in the list with the others. We clearly know Jesus' driving uh, motive in all things was to please God. And yet, in that list of Luke 2.52, it was a part of Jesus' life he exercised and grew within. And so the way I think Brother Turner would probably advise us or clarify that a little bit is to say that there has to be a specific focus on our spiritual lives. Yes, Christ is the center of our lives, but there are things that we do directly because we are Christians and those demand our time, those demand our energy and our money, our resources, and so we need to view the practice of our faithfulness in a practical way, knowing that he is at the center of all things. And so I think that's how we can kind of resolve that. Uh, it's not really tension, but just maybe just a, a semantics kind of issue that everything we do on this wheel is going to come from Christ. Part of that is going to involve our spiritual faithfulness, our activity of the spiritual things he tells us to do. If they don't have a spoke, they're never going to get done. Okay? Think about how many people claim to be Christians. They claim Christ is at the center of my life, and yet there's really no spoke for spiritual things. Or maybe it's neglected. And so it's the practice of that uh, system and that life of faith with Christ is at the center. Okay. Here's all six. I want to introduce them quickly. We won't discuss them. I want to ask a, a couple of discussion questions from, from folks in the audience. Then we'll, we'll use what time we have left to address them. So you have the spiritual level. So the exercise of our faith. Worship. Study. Prayer. Relationships. Fellowship. All those beautiful things. We have to exercise and, and devote time and resources to those things. We have to have a commitment to growing spiritually. We also have the family area of life. God gives us a family. We come from a family. A lot of, most of the time we start a family of our own. We have these relationships that God gives us and he expects us to live within the framework of those and tend to those. He gives us responsibilities within them. It's an area of life. We also have the social area of life. We're not meant to live in isolation, so he gives us family, but he also gives us people to live among. So we work with people. We go to school with people. We interact with people in the grocery store, in the restaurants. We have a social life and we have a responsibility as Christians to tend to that social interaction. He includes hospitality as a part of that social responsibility. We have a responsibility to work. It's the one Don mentioned. Man, was, we were created with the design to work from the beginning. 
And so we all have jobs. We know we need jobs to have an income and to provide for families. We also have the need for recreation, which he includes rest within. So Miss Debbie's comment about that book and the need to not do, to do nothing sometimes. So recreation falls in that. It's, it's good to rest and exercise and, and be sure we get enough sleep and take care to that area of our lives. And then finally, there's the need for financial balance. That if we do all other five well, but we let the financial areas of life slip, it's going to undermine all the rest. God gives us money. He blesses us with the opportunity to work for it, the skills, the knowledge to save and to, to invest and all those kind of things. But if we're out of balance there, then our lives will be difficult. Now, with those in mind, I ask Sister Tammy to be, if she wouldn't mind commenting quickly on this question. What kinds of things do people and their families, do they value or do they regret most when they look back on their lives? Ms. Tammy does a great job as a hospice nurse and works even in the organization of a lot of those things. And so I'm guessing she's had a lot of those conversations and heard those things from people. And so just wanted her insight as to how people um, look back on their lives. I would just say that I'm very thankful to live in the South because 95% of our patients have some type of relationship with the Lord because they've mm -hmm. been taught from childhood. Okay. Um, I can pretty much tell you those who are true Christians that are members of the church because they pass from this life calmly and peacefully. Hmm. The other 5%, I would say, you know, have a lot of regrets about how they've treated their families and, you know, alienated families. Mm. And I would say that um, I've never heard anybody say, I wish I'd spent more time away from home working uh, instead of being with my family. Right. That's good. Thank you for that. That's very consistent with, with other folks I've heard from that realm. Nobody gets to the end of this life and looks back and says, I worked a lot. I wish I'd worked more. Yeah, you know, I wish I would have earned 5% more than I did. Yeah, you know, I wish I would have spent less time with my family. Right? So um, we can learn from those who go before us. And we can learn from those moments when it's our family, perhaps, or those that we're connected to. And just see that when life does get out of balance, it's probably going to lead to some regrets. And so we can listen to those now and correct them now before we get to those ends and have to look back with any sorts of regret. We can do as she opened with there. We can look back with, with anticipation or look back with joy, knowing that we made some right decisions. We valued the Lord most. We did value our family. And we can have that peace and comfort at the end of this life. So thank you, Tammy, for that. Anybody have anything to add on those, that question? The younger people than it is the older because you got the children at home. And most of the time you're more busy then with your work, trying to get moved up and mm. get more hours and make more money. So yep, that's it. I, I can look back on my life and see where I work too much. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That is, that is so true. The devil wants us to, to, to have this sense of success and climb the ladder. And the earlier the better, right? You got you to gotta strike while the iron's hot. Or somebody else is going to jump in ahead of you. Well, we, can have, we should have the same perspective about our children. If we don't do it when they're young, somebody's going to jump in ahead of us. And they're going to raise our children instead of us in the Lord. So that's very powerful. Thank you for sharing that, Denny. Anyone else? Next question is from my favorite banker. Um, he mentions having a checkbook out of balance lead to financial stress. One of the things that Amanda commonly tells me just in general, not you know, giving away identities or anything like that, but just how easy it is for people and for us to get out of balance. And specifically, she sees that in the financial realm with, with people in their checkbooks and that kind of thing. So just quickly tell how easy it is and how do we come to where we get out of balance. Um, most people now do not keep a check register. That's how I was taught. You keep a check register. You balance by what the bank says and you know what your balance is, what you can spend. Um, most people call every day on the phone and get their balance and they think that's the amount of money they have, but they don't take into consideration that they might have wrote a check that hasn't cleared or even check card purchases don't clear, all check card purchases don't clear immediately. So the next day they're overdrawn and they say, why well, I'm overdrawn? 
We're like, well, can we have your checkbook register and we'll help you? And they're like, I don't have a checkbook register. And we're like, well, we don't have any clue what you had out. And neither do they. Right. Okay. Very good. You'll see that principle. Any light bulbs go off for you? That's why I'm always overdrunk. No, I hope not. Uh, I had Amanda to come in uh, with our, I don't know if, Dan, were you in there, Danielle, when she taught? You may have already been graduated, I don't know. I, I, had her, I had her teach the young people at Midway, here's how you do a checkbook. I haven't followed up with any of them to see if they do it, but uh, it, it's, it's important because you've got what you are accountable for, what you know you've done. You've got what the bank side says. You need to get those two balance, right? And if one of you's got an error, the other one can help you find it. And that's the accurate picture. So we get out of balance when we stop having an accurate picture of how we're living in a certain area. You see that principle? And so clearly what we would say in any of these areas is when we find ourselves feeling that bump in the road. Oh, I'm out of balance. I got a bump. We need to lay our life down. Here's how my, I've lived my time. Here's how I've used my energy. Here's how the Lord says I need to live in this area. And be sure that we get those together on the same page. Am I allowing the Lord to reveal where I'm out of balance and how I can improve it? Okay, see the principle? Make sense? Like I showed you yesterday, they're going by Okay, thank you for clarifying. That's good. Y'all see why she's my favorite, right? There's another thing. They're not teaching the children in the schools now how to write checks. Okay. Because they're not going to do that. Right. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and not only do you have the debit card that can be a little harder to track, but now with just automatic online recurring subscription kind of stuff that you don't even have to do anything physically, um, it, can, it can really get out of hand. So Amanda said, I didn't get back there in time to her with a microphone, but she said, misinformation. See, if we're, if we're measuring any area of life by a different standard than what God wants us to, that's misinformation. And eventually we're going to act on that misinformation and are going to get out of balance. So what Don and Denny mentioned about work, that was based off of, that's often based off of noble motives. You know, nobody said, hey, I want to be a workaholic so my marriage can end. Nobody does that. They base it off of, I want to work because this is the noble thing to do. This is the manly thing to do. And yet it has a cost because it wasn't laid down next to what God said about the importance of that area of life. And so we need to always come back to the truth about any area, about any action, so that it's going to cause us to be in balance in any single area and thus as the whole. All right. Very good. Very good comments. Let's move into the six areas. I, I, I understand that almost all of us probably are aware of how they're important. Uh, but just for the sake of, of the younger ones, perhaps, uh, or a, a solid reminder for each of us, I do think it's important we see how the Lord designed each of us to have these areas uh, in our lives and how important they are. So even though we may be familiar with them, let's uh, be honest in, in reevaluating uh, the importance of these. So first, you do have the exercise of the spiritual side of our lives. Ephesians 4. 11 and 12 tells us the standard we're growing into. How do you know if we're balanced? Well, we're, I'm growing into Christ. Am I looking more and more like Christ lived every day? That should be the measure for our spiritual lives. Okay, he says it takes the mind of Christ. That's related to humility and serving each other's interests in Philippians 2, being a servant. Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 2, that in the word of God, that thing that's greater than any eye has ever seen or ear has ever heard, the revealed word of God, is where we have the mind of Christ. So it should be our guide in, in living the spiritual life. That list that we've referenced a few times, what we commonly call the Christian graces, 2 Peter 1, 5 uh, through 7, is the list. But then he says, verses 8 and 9, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, there's constant growth in this area. 
They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you hear it? Ineffective, unfruitful, that's out of balance. You don't want a spoke that's ineffective. If that spoke is broken, if it's short, if it's missing, then your whole wheel is ineffective. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted he is, that he is blind, having forgotten he was cleansed from his former sins. So if we don't have a, a spiritual focus, a spiritual spoke in our lives, the practice of our faith, what good is it doing to say or to claim that Christ is at the center of our lives in the first place? We keep exercising those things. Yes, Edward. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. When one goes, it puts the whole thing at risk. The rest are, are going to happen next. And it happened a lot faster than the first one went, right? So... Um, that's why balance is important, meaning I'm going to address every area of my life. Is that easy? No. But it's what's best. It's what can bear the weight of this life. I find it interesting, this is a side note, but um, I think we crave a single answer sometimes. We crave just one statement, one thing that will describe everything I do. How often did Jesus... Give people that short nugget, that short sound bite. You know, they ask him, what's the one commandment that I must do? And he gives them two. And, and, and the one, the first one has four components. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. He, he doesn't want us to just be narrow and, and just have one single thing we can do well. He wants us to be able to bear the load of life because life is hard. And so to exercise discipline, to get balanced so that we can bear the weight of life, yes, it's going to involve discipline. It's going to involve self-control. It's going to involve some failures. But we can keep growing because of what God gives us. And it's going to help every area of our lives. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, Ms. Sandra. Sandra said someone's asked her, why do we meet on Wednesday nights? There are several correct answers, but Ms. Sandra said practically we need it for balance. We had breakfast with Brother Andy Saturday morning. He said the churches in Ghana, uh, West Africa, they meet six nights a week. Every night but Saturday, they're assembled to worship and study. That's not a pattern for us to have to follow, but it's insightful, isn't it? So we need that time together. We need that time with the Word of God together. And so balance is what we're achieving. One extreme to this spoke is to say, I can only devote myself to study and to prayer. I'm not going to interact with people. I'm not going to go work a day job. I'm just going to separate. That's, that's a monastery. That's a, a, a place where nuns live. They call it a nunnery or I don't... But, Wherever, you know, that's, that's not how God intended us for us to live. It's to use our spiritual growth in all these other areas to affect the world for good, for God's glory. The other extreme would be to say, I'm not going to tend to it because God is good, he loves me, and I'm not going to worry about the inward man, my soul, because all the rest is good. You know, we come up with any number of reasons to avoid it. We have to tend to it. If we were to rank, yes, it's the most important, but it's also practically something that has to be done in terms of our time and resources. Family, we've talked about it. Uh, you know, when you talk about being stewards, we're stewards of the gospel. Uh, right behind that, the Lord expects for us to be stewards of a family, the people, the souls he entrusts us with. If the only people we help get to heaven are our children, our spouses, we will not be a failure whatsoever. We're expected to do as much as we can for as many as we can. But he entrusts for us family, a spouse, ch children, grandchildren. And so we must bear those responsibilities coming from the Lord, those responsibilities from the Lord. So he gives those instructions to husbands and wives, Ephesians 5, plenty about parents and children. Included in that is discipline. Proverbs 22, verse 6 is training. That's a broader term. 
You get to Proverbs 23, and it talks about the act of discipline or corrective punishment. Not punishment to destroy their spirit, but just punishment to correct their actions into the right direction. And both of those are needed. Both of those come out of love, he would tell us in Proverbs. We're going to be balanced. We're not going to let our children get whatever they want just because they cry or because they pout or because they have pretty blue eyes. We're going to love them, so we're going to put them in the right path and keep their path honed the way it should be. And we're going to tell them how beautiful they are in the eyes of God. Question. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that's a great statement. Yeah. Right. Be considerate about what's best for your children, what's best for your family. Absolutely. And I think that to tie the dots back to other things we've already talked about. When I do that, I need to do that. We must do that. It needs to be what the Lord says is best for my children, right? What the Lord says is best for them might not be what my heart always thinks is best for them. Because my heart would say they get a toy every time they go to Walmart. But the Lord says you need to be careful about giving them, you know, that there's a way in which you bless them. And it's not to let them make, call the shots. You know, I've got one that could eat ice cream or waffles or a candy bar three meals a day. But that's not what's best for her. So I have to, we have to work with what we know the Lord tells us is best for her, for them. Why is, why do we, we saw this last week. Why is there a level of excitement and interest and enthusiasm when it comes to discussing family-based topics from the Word of God? Then that reveals something important we need to listen to? That there is great interest, that there is great strain, that when we, when we don't do it well, when, we, when it's unbalanced, we regret it. When it is in balance and we do it the Lord's way, there's great joy and satisfaction. See, that, that's not arguing from experience, but it's showing us that experience validates the truth of the, God, the Word of God. That we're drawn to those topics. There's a marriage retreat that just ended today up in the mountains that we had uh, three or four couples from here to go to. And it's just grown and it just exploded into hundreds of couples, into the thousands of total people. Because there's interest, because that's how God designed us. And when it's out of balance, we regret it. When it's in balance, it's great joy. Social, okay? We mentioned Luke 2.52, in favor with man. Jesus was constantly going about and active socially. Wasn't that one of the primary accusations from the Pharisees? He's too active with sinners. He eats with them. Okay, first miracle happens at a wedding in Cana. He ate, ate in Matthew's house. He ate in um, the Pharisee's house in Luke 18. He's socially where people are. And that was one of his arguments to the Jews. I was teaching in public places the whole time. You could have found me because you knew where I was at. He was a social creature. He was a social being in getting the message out and serving other people. That also includes hospitality. Seek, pursue after hospitality. When we recognize what we've been given, how God blesses us, and we interact with other people in the social uh, frameworks of life, it should follow we, we welcome them, we serve each other, we seek to bless their lives in some way because of the love of God blessing us. Next, the idea of work. God designed us from the beginning to work. Sometimes I, I feel like uh, we look at how Adam was given the punishment of hard work after he sinned, and we think that's where work came from. That's where harder work came from. Work came from the beginning. Before we're ever told about how Eve came into being, we're told that God said, you are to tend to what I've given you. You're to work. Before Eve came, he told Adam, work to name the animals. And so we're just designed to work. And I can't help, and maybe, I don't remember if I talked about this with Daniel or not, but I can't help but think, that as mental illness and those kind of things, and I'm not making any judgment about those realms, I'm just offering a, a suggestion or a, a question. As those continue to rise and often kind of just boom, especially in younger generations, and so too the art and the lifestyle of physical labor dwindles tremendously 
Is there a correlation, especially among younger generations? We lay around all day. We don't sleep at night because we sleep all day. People on their devices all night, not doing any work, not being physically active. And so our minds and our bodies don't get the refreshment that they need. Work is how we're designed. And he, he's the one that designed us that way. He ties it to eating. We know that passage, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. If a man's not willing to work, you need to let him eat. Ephesians 6, both slaves and masters are to be, or employees and employers are to do that role as if they were doing it for the Lord. So you may be a slave. You may be living in this person's house, serving their every need, but do it as if you're doing it to the Lord. It's the same is true as we work. We should have a, a sense of excellence and commitment to doing our best because of that. We do have the recreational need. Uh, 3 John verse 2, uh, he sends this prayer to this church he's, he loves. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. I pray your body is doing well just as much as I pray that your soul is. Jesus would go away, Mark 6, to a desolate place and rest for a little while. They did that, verse 32, in a desolate place by themselves. 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, bodily training is of some value. Yes, spiritual practice. Godliness is of value in every way, but we need to work. We need to burn calories. We need to increase that oxygen intake. All of that is how we were designed as human beings. Finally, the financial way of life. We need to be good stewards. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2 is about the gospel, but it's true about all stewards. We've been given a tremendous opportunity in this time, in this era of our country's history. That affects us financially. Are we good stewards of those things? Don't let it become the treasure. We treasure God instead. We treasure the things of heaven. That's going to dictate what and where we place our money. He even says, Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, to the Israelites, I'm the one that gives you the power to make wealth, to get wealth. He's not against wealth. He's against it having us, possession of our lives. So he expects us to properly manage all that he does give. And so there's the six spokes. Ultimately, Christ is the center of all of this. So we move toward a conclusion. Here are the two takeaways. To the, to the degree that our various areas of life are in balance and under control, that's the degree to which we will have a balanced and thus enjoyable and satisfied life. If we find that that satisfaction is always out of reach, it's probably time for some serious introspection. It's time to balance the checkbook of our life and look at all these areas and see where we, we add up. And he's got a helpful way of doing that in the book if, that, if you'd like to consult that. What do we do well? What do we need to improve in each of these? So if we overemphasize one area to the neglect of another, it will lead to imbalance, thus risk the whole. One last thing about balance. Um, you know, I'll do this. You hold one foot and stand it, keep it. You know the trick to it? I learned it at baseball camp. I don't know how, how old I was. I, I, my mind was blown when they told me how to do it. You stare at one single focused item, you can get balance. You can hold it all day long if you'll focus on one single point. So when we get out of balance, the key is to once again narrow our field of vision to focus on the center, focus on the things of Christ, so we can once again address the various areas that are out of balance and do his will. Two challenges, quickly. Um, if you want to go ahead and ring the bell, you can, Edward. But what, Identify. Is there one area right now that's causing me to be out of balance? Is there, are there some alarm bells going off? Try to identify it. Use the word of God first and foremost to help you in that. But here's another level to that question. Find a person you trust. Maybe it's a person you share your goal with. And say, hey, if you were to look at those six areas of my life, is there one that you might think is out of balance based on your time with me? See, that's bringing in somebody else you trust to say, is this measuring up with what God wants me to measure up with? If you want to take it one step further, try to track your time for at least three days this week. Maybe 30-minute segments, maybe an hour segment. Uh, if you do have a smartphone, you'd like to, to give a few things a try that can help you. There's an app that I've been using for about two or three years, and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind now because it's based on location, where you go. It's called Life Cycle. 
And so I can look back on any given week or month and it, it tabulates how many hours or minutes I spent doing whatever it was at home or at work or, um, you know, wherever categories you program into it. It takes a little getting used to, but it's pretty insightful. And now new, newer iPhones have the uh, ability to do the screen time. So you can track your settings. You can track how long you're on it, on which apps, all those kind of things. So explore those if you have not. And that may can help you specifically in your digital life because that's certainly an area that is a temptation to get us out of balance. So hope you'll consider both of those challenges. Identify that one area, share it with someone, ask them, and then try to track your time. It can be insightful figuring out our lives of balance. Questions? Anything to add? Yes, Daniel.